Welcome to our first lecture on Microsoft Word Basics. Uh, many, in fact, I would hazard a guess that most individuals in this class do not need to watch this video. If you have a good understanding about um, how to set up documents in Microsoft Word, you're going to be very bored <laughs> right now with this presentation. However, I know that there are folks who either don't have a lot of experience with word processing generally, or perhaps they've been using some other tool and, and they haven't been using Microsoft Word, and so they aren't familiar with some of the important features of Microsoft Word. So I'm going to cover this assuming very little knowledge um, at, the, at the kind of onset. So let's get started. We've gotten into Microsoft Word, and here we have our document. The first thing that I do whenever I'm doing work on a document that I'm formatting is I hit this little key right here. It's a backwards uh, a paragraph sign. Let me just type a sentence to show you uh, something. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Down here, by the way, I can make this bigger. This is another good hint for how to work with documents. We're going to be doing a lot of very detailed work. And so the bigger you can make your material, the more likely it is that you're going to see errors. So working with 200% uh, or even higher can be a smart strategy for seeing something that might be difficult to see. So this is what it looks like when I have this P, uh, backwards P, which is the paragraph sign, um, clicked on. If I unclick it, you can see it becomes a lot easier to read. But while I'm working on it, this is a really handy button. Let me show you what I mean. If I accidentally hit the space bar twice, I can see very clearly I have two spaces here. When I go here, it may not be so obvious, especially if I were to bring it down to 100%. Um, it's kind of, I mean, uh, my text will tell me that I have two spaces there, but if I didn't have that lit up, it might not be obvious. And so for that reason, we want to do this when we are working initially on our, do or when we're, maybe not initially when we're composing it, but when we're getting into the nitty gritty parts of it, which will be most of what we do in this class, you are definitely going to want this lit, this uh, box to be uh, presented in this way. So two hints so far, let's go ahead and, and write these down, are use the backwards paragraph sign. We're in the home menu, we're going over here to the paragraph. And also down here, blow up your, your content. So make it big. Those are two very helpful hints. Okay. Let's talk about the fonts that we're going to use. I have this set up in the fonts that I want to pick. I have Times New Roman and I have 12 point. We'll be doing virtually everything in this class in Times New Roman and 12 point font. My suggestion would be for you to just make that your default font on your computer. It's going to save you a lot of unhappy things because um, you will uh, virtually always lose at least one point um, if you do not use Times New Roman or you use some size other than 12 point. So how do you set that as your default? Well, let's first of all talk about how we set it up. Let's assume that I had used some other font. So we'll say I'm going to use Calibri. Okay, so here we go. Now I'm going to type in this. Now is the time for all good, good men to come to the aid of their country. You can see that it's a different look. Um, as we get the font even bigger, it's easier to see the differences between the two. You can see at the top of Times New Roman, there's these little curly cues and lines and things like that on many of the letters here at the beginning of the S, at the top of the H. This isn't the way that you and I print when we're printing. None of us put this little H thing at the top of that, and we don't put a little cap on our S's. It would take a lot of time to print if we did that. Uh, Calibri looks much more like what our actual handwriting looks like. This is called serif font. Those little doodads are serifs, and this is called sans serif font. Sans serif, it's a French expression. 
There we go. And sans en France, it, in, in French, it means without. So without those little fancy little marks, those doodads. Um, that's what we have here. Because this looks much more like handwriting, it's a less formal type of font. Um, and as a result, it's not appropriate for legal writing. You certainly can use it for other purposes. I mean, it's none of my business what you choose to use other things for. I will tell you this, though, that once you get used to a font, other fonts are going to look kind of weird to you and not so appealing. And so it's kind of a good idea to, to adopt Times New Roman and use it all the time. And then when you're doing legal work and you see a different font, you'll be like, oh, that's the wrong font. Your, your eyes will be tuned to that and you won't make a casual mistake in the area. Of course, that's your decision whether you want to make, but I can tell you that you are opening yourself up to the possibility that if you're using lots of fonts, you may forget which, which font to use. So let's say that I've done this in some font other than Times New Roman. How do I change it? Well, there's a couple of ways. One thing is I can just highlight it. So what do I do for that is I take my mouse and I click on the left side and then just slide across to the end. Then I lift my, fing lift my finger that was clicking on it. Then I can go over here and change it. I can change it to Times New Roman. I can make it a bigger font. I can make it a smaller font. I can do lots of cool things. I can make it bold. I can make it italics. I can underline it. I can do lots of cool things to it. I don't want to do those things. I just want to make it Times New Roman 12 point. So I can do it just global or just on one particular highlighted item, but I can also do it on a whole big document. So let's say that I'll just kind of make this a variety of different fonts just for fun. Okay, so we have a variety of fonts. If I don't want to go through and highlight a long document, I mean this document could be 10, 20, 50 pages long. I can go over here and hit select select all and all of my text will be selected and so now I can go in and pick the font that I want to use and get everything looking right. I suggest you do this select all and get your font right at the end whenever you are done with your document. That will save you the heartache because I pretty routinely see students who accidentally have just one character in the wrong font. Maybe it's something they borrowed from a template or they cut and pasted it from some other document. I will check to see if you have anything that isn't Times New Roman and you'll get a deduction even if it's just one character. So one insurance, uh, insurance practice you can have is to collect, to select on collect, select all, sorry, and then go and check this. This will clear or fix the problem. So our second, our third hint is select all and pick your fonts. Let's talk about how we do this globally forever and ever. If you decide, you know what, Gruber, I'm just going to adopt on my computer Times New Roman 12 point for always. Okay, so the way you do it is you go here. We're still in the home tab. We go here to font. Let me just... And we click on this little button right here. And we go in to font and we pick Times New Roman or whatever we want to. We pick regular, we pick 12. And we hit set as default. And then most of the time we're probably going to want this to replace our normal template. So this will become our normal template. We hit OK. And now when I open a new document, let me go to new that will be what it assumes I want. You can see right here. It assumes that that's, that's my default or my usual standing. So I, don't, I can go on automatic pilot. Once I make that change once, and I'm always working from this computer, um, unless I'm cutting and pasting from some other source, it's going to be Times New Roman. Now the reality is in this course we're going to be cutting and pasting often, so you're still going to need to use this select all. Because if I cut and paste something, let me just, let me just switch this up, we'll make this a different font. We'll pick this font. Copy. So when I take something into my, so you can see this one is still times new Roman, but if I cut and paste it in here, choosing to use the destination theme, it's going to take the destination theme. If I choose to use 
or merge formatting, it's going to take the format that's in my document. So it depends on which button I hit here. But I can easily hit the wrong one, and I'm going to bring the formatting from the other document, even though it says Times New Roman up here. So for that reason, even if you globally change it and set your new default as Times New Roman 12 point, you're still going to want to select all and pick Times New Roman. You're going to want to do both of those fixes every single time. So have a checklist of these things that you're going to do each time. Each one of these steps takes a few seconds. Um, all the steps combined probably won't even take you a minute. So it's time well spent to get your documents the way that you want them to be um, for, your, for, your, for the grade. Okay. So we've talked about four things. We've talked about turning on the backward paragraph when we're looking for problems in our document. We've talked about blowing up the appearance of the document. We're not changing the point up here. We're just making it bigger and easier to see. We've talked about at the end selecting all and going in and making sure that your fonts are correct. And we've talked about also changing the font for all times. Okay. Um, now we're going to talk about typos. So let's say um, I uh, forgot to put a space here. And let's say I misspell this word. And let's say I um, left out this U. You. You'll see that the words are underlined in red afterwards. Let me also do another one. You can see this one is in blue. Um, so we have some problems here. I can tell immediately that there are problems because of this red and blue underlining. Um, but let me show you what's behind that because I only have this red and blue underlining because I made certain choices in my Microsoft Word to begin with. So when you look at your documents, you may well not see this type of content. So let me show you how you set it up so you're going to get these hints because having Microsoft Word help you get your documents right can be a tremendous benefit. I mean, it can give you, um, it can be the difference easily in a letter grade, maybe even in two letter grades. Um, it's doing the heavy lifting. You're taking the advantages of it. So let's talk about how to do it. So we go over here to File, click on that. And then we go to options at the bottom. And I'm going to alert you to the fact that depending upon the version of um, Microsoft Word you have, the, these items may be in a different location. Then we're going to go to proofing. And now you can see we have lots of different options. Um, these are the choices that I make. I ask the computer to ignore words all in uppercase because a lot of times those are abbreviations and they're not going to spell out correctly. Also to ignore words that contain numbers. A lot of uh, case uh, uh, file uh, case client matter numbers and case numbers have um, alphanumeric combinations and you don't want constantly having to tell the computer no that's all right. I also want it to ignore internet and file addresses, um, but I do want it to flag or to tell me when I repeat a word. Sometimes you want to repeat a word, but many times you don't. If I happen to be using a lot of uh, French terminology, I may want to um, accent the uppercase in French. Usually most French speakers don't do that, but it's not unheard of to do that. Um, if you're using a lot of French and Spanish, you may want to think about uh, spelling options. Let's go down to our next section. You want it to check spelling as you type. As you can see here, it's telling me, hey, there's a spelling problem. If I were to make that go away, then it wouldn't tell me as I'm, as I'm typing. And you can see the benefit of that. I can immediately see the problem. It's also going to mark grammar errors as I type. It's also going to mark frequently con confused words. It's going to check grammar with spelling, and it's going to show readability statistics. Now, not all versions of Word are going to give you all of these options. If you have a more stripped down version of Word, you can go to the computer lab, and you'll probably be able to be on a computer that has most, if not all, of these choices. When I get to writing style, I pick grammar and refinements. Then I'm going to go to settings. 
And I'm going to click almost everything here. I'm not going to go through each one of them, except the ones I think that are important. Definitely going to click passive voice and passive voice with unknown actor. I'm going to pick the Oxford comma and I'm going to pick having punctuation inside quotations. I prefer only one space between sentences. Some people prefer two. Some people, uh, whatever you do, you ought to be consistent. So one or two is what you ought to click. Uh, the trend is definitely towards one space per, uh, between sentences. Uh, but if you feel strongly that two spaces are what you want to use, I'm not going to tell you otherwise. Just be consistent with your documents. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK here. And I'm going to hit OK here. And now I'm going to run it. I'm going to hit Review. And I'm going to hit Spelling and Grammar. And it's going to tell me, hey, wait a second. I think you meant to do a space here. So I'm going to hit um, Change. And then C-I-M-E. You can see there's lots of different things it can be. I, I look through this as, oh, it should have been come. So I'm going to click on that one and hit change. And then here, this should be country, so I'm going to hit change. Then it, it notes that this is in passive voice. Usually for passive voice errors, it, it does, well, sometimes it makes a suggestion. In this case, it did make a suggestion. So I'm going to adopt that suggestion. Most of the time with passive voice, it will not make a suggestion. It'll just let you know, hey, that's passive voice, you might want to consider changing. But in this case, I can adopt its change. Then after I've done that, it's going to give me readability statistics. What you care about are words per sentence right here. You can see our average length of sentence is 11.6. You would ideally like this to be 20 or less. And you want the number of passive voice sentences which here we don't have any passive voice sentences. You'd ideally like this to be below 10% or below. And the grade level, we want to be nine, ninth grade or lower. As you can see, we're quite a bit lower than ninth grade. It's, this, this is not uh, representative of the work you're going to do. You're going to find it very difficult to stay below ninth grade. If you're ninth, 10th, 11th, you're probably OK. But the goal is to be lower. I mean, you, you're not ever going to get to be sixth grade or something. You're, if you get down to ninth grade, you're doing great. Um, so th that's kind of the expectation or the standard. So I'm going to click here. You can see all of my red and green have gone away. So that's something you want to do. You want to save that for the end, but you'll definitely want to run that through. You again, here, how do we do that? We go to the review button. We click on spelling and grammar, and we go through that checklist. So you're definitely going to want to do that. But again, before you do that, you're going to want to set up all of those options that we just went through. Make sure you have what you want set up. OK? So that is the proofing aspect, hugely important. Now we're going to talk about tabbing. Tabbing couldn't be easier, but so many students don't, don't get a good handle on this. So let's look at the keyboard first of all. This is kind of a silly keyboard. I apologize for it. There is this button here. It's just to the left of the Q on your keyboard, and it literally says tab. We're going to use this a lot in this course. Some students will be tempted to use the space bar, which is right below the B. It's kind of the longer bar here. Um, they perform very different functions. Yes, absolutely, you'll be using the space bar in this course, but they're fundamentally different purposes. I'm going to explain to you why you want to use the tab key so often, and I'm going to show you how to use the tab key. But you don't have to agree with me. If you think the space bar is better, you're, uh, you're, you're obviously can have whatever opinion you want. Just in this class, put your opinion aside because you're going to lose a lot of points. Because if you use the space bar, when you should be using the tab key, I will know because I will open up your document and I'll click on this button and I'll be able to see. Let me show you the differences. When I hit space bar, I get all these lovely dots. When I hit the tab key, I get these little arrows. Now I can hit a space bar so it goes all the way out to where my tab key is. Let me just type a letter. I'll type a capital T, and I'll cut, type a capital T here. 
Now I'm going to hide this. It looks like these are right below each other. Just looking at it without this button turned on, I wouldn't be able to tell which one had I had spaced over and which one I had tapped. So um, if you were to submit this and I never turn on the formatting, it might look like they were both tabbed. But I will turn on the formatting and I'll be able to see, oh, this is tabbed and this is spaced. Generally speaking, you're only going to use a space bar once or twice at a time. If you are using a space bar more than twice in a row, so in other words, you've hit it once, twice, by the third time you hit it, it's probably not a good idea. You probably ought to be thinking, wait a second, more than two hits in my space bar, I ought to be hitting the tab key. So the rule is no more than two space bar hits. So you may say, well, what, what difference does it make? I mean, if they line up, who care, why do you care whether we space it or tab it? Let me show you. Um, let's say that this was in the middle of a document. So um, you can see here that I wrote the same word, Bob and Bob. These used to line up perfectly, but now they don't, right? Because this, um, let me just, let me, let me, let me go back and do one thing. Let me show you another thing here. Let's, oops. Copy this line. Copy. Okay, so I'm going to type um, Bob and uh, let's see. Um, say somebody's name is Ill. Okay, kind of a weird name. Has the same number of letters though, and yet you can see that it doesn't space out correctly. These don't line up exactly right because the computer gives more space to a capital B than to a capital L. It gives more space to a lowercase O and a lowercase B than to lowercase L's. And so this is going to be farther over. It's very difficult to line up text if you're using the space bar. But if you're using the tab, let's see how that works. So this is our initial tab structure. Copy. So I can type Bob and I can type Ill and guess what? They still line up. Even if this name becomes long, we'll say Bobby Jones. All I'm going to have to do is tab once and it's still going to line up. But here, if I try to line these two T's up, it's never going to line up exactly. This actually came pretty close, but it will always look a little bit squiggly. Um, and and it, when you just have two items in a line, it won't be obvious that it's squiggly, but when you add more and more items, you'll see that it won't be just perfectly straight. It'll look a little bit wiggly like that. It doesn't look professional or polished. The space bar doesn't give you that clean type uh, effect that the tab will. And that's one of the reasons that you're going to use the tab when you're, instead of spacing more than twice, you're going to hit the tab button. Another reason you're going to want to use the tab button over the space bar is that the documents that you prepare, you're routinely going to use um, as models. So you, let's say you have a particular demand letter that you send out all the time. You're going to have to add and subtract some stuff from it, but you probably use that letter time and time again. If you have spaces in it, it's going to, take you a lot longer to revise that letter to add the new information because you're going to have to line up the text and um, count how many spaces you have and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot easier to count tabs than spaces. So keep in mind we're going to use tabs a lot more than we're going to use a space bar and I'm going to check. So let's imagine this. Let's say that I had put some, this, this happens very frequently. I will see somebody do a combination. Maybe they did 
a few space bars, and then they started tabbing. I mean, that's going to work out okay. It's going to line up well. Um, whether or not you get a deduction is going to vary. Sometimes I deduct for this, sometimes I don't. If, if it's just one or two spaces, I probably won't. If it's several spaces, I probably will. So my suggestion would be not to have any spaces, but you can probably get away with one or two. I'm not going to guarantee it, but you can probably get away with one or two. But a combination of spaces and tabs are not going to work because, again, you might end up having a much longer version of this name, and so now these spaces become much more tricky to manage. So the takeaway is use the tab keys. That's the way you can get things to line up nice and neat, and it makes it a lot easier for you to revise uh, when you are deciding to reuse this letter for another purpose. So use tab instead of the space bar. I would make a notation in your file that when one of the last steps you're going to do is clean up is you're going to turn on your paragraph sign and look and see are there any places I have three space bars together. If I do, I'm going to look at it and see if I should have used the tab key instead. Kind of already showed you about the uh, the bold uh, from time to time we will use bold um, and it's very easy to use you just highlight the text that you want to so again that's uh, starting at the beginning uh, clicking down with your uh, left click button on your mouse and going as far as you want when you've gone as far as you want you lift it up it will be in gray and just go up here and tap, click on the bold now it's in bold you can also italicize it or you can underline it. All of those things will work. There's even other choices you can do. Let me just show you some. You can do small caps. Sometimes people use this for headings. It's a really sharp look in my opinion. It's very kind of um, law review look is what I would say. Um, but you don't have to use that. But there are times where you do need to use bold, underline, and italics. And so you need to know where those keys are in order to be successful with that. Um, let's talk about centering. We do center things in some legal documents. But there is something to remember that there are two centering skills I'm going to show you. And whenever you are in a position where you need to center something, please pause and think, which centering technique should I use? So let me show you both to you, and then we'll talk through when we use which technique. So the first centering technique is maybe we're doing the title of a document. So let's say it's uh, first original complaint. We'll say it's plaintiffs. Okay. And so here I go. Now I'm going to just click on this button right up here. So I, I had initially had it left justified. Left justification is when everything starts on my left margin. If I want right justification, it's going to bounce over here to this margin. So let me just show you what that looks like. Ah, look at that. If I want to spread stuff out over the whole length, it's going to be this one. Well, it doesn't go all the way to the end, so that's not necessarily the best example. But what I want to do here is center. It's going to be in the middle. I'm going to shrink this up a little bit so you can see the whole page. Here we go. This is in the middle of the page. What are some things that can be problematic when I center? Sometimes what people do, let me just go back to how I was originally, is maybe they had some spaces here at the beginning. And now they hit center. Well, guess what? Those spaces are part of the centering. Actually, they got rid of it, so let me, that's not a good example. Um, well, actually, th th this, so, sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. So here we go. Oh, how about this example? So I start back here, and let's say that, um, let's see what happens if I tab it. Let me center it. No, I guess it's not doing it this way. Uh, some versions of Word, though, will consider spaces that you've added. Now, maybe if I do it at the end, it will. 
this. It's not doing it, but some versions will. So it's a good practice in your title not to have any spaces or tabs in the front here or any spaces at the end. Also to make sure that you don't have any weird things with, with your uh, tab settings up here. Because if you do that, it's going to get funky. So make sure that whatever you've chosen for your margins to be are the same margins you have here. Because you can see if you get too funky, this isn't looking centered at all at this point. So that's the main thing to watch when we're centering using this center function. Most people don't have any trouble with that function. Let me show you the other way we're going to center. And this is what I usually call tab to the approximate center. That's my term of art for this. We use this in letters a lot. I'm going to first of all show you how to do it, and then I'm going to show you why we do this. Okay? So what I could do is I could center it like that. And you can see how it lines up neatly on the page. But an alternative that I could do is I could tab either maybe this one or this one. Both are near the, um, the center. doesn't matter which one we use. But we're trying to use our tab key. So I used, I don't know why my, my tabs are not showing up here. But I really am hitting the tab key. Anyway, I really am hitting the tab key here um, as I go over. Um, the uh, I hit the tab key about about four or five times, and you can see that this moves as I tab. Let's go back, and you can see it. See, as I tab, it jumps. I've ha my tabs are set for half inches. You can set your tabs for whatever you want to, but in this case, it's about half inch. So we're going to tab to the approximate center. It's not going to be the exact center. That's okay. I mean, you could find the exact center. Let's, let me just go ahead and, actually, it's going to give me weird, weird because of my tabs. Okay, so I'm going to do center. So actually, my T is right below the lowercase a. So what I could do is I could set my tab right here. That would be fine. I could do that, but I don't have to. It's fine to just go ahead and tab over to the approximate center. And that's really what I expect you to do. So you may think to yourself, well, okay, fine. I understand what you're doing, but why not just do the real center? Why do something approximate when it's easier just to do the real center? Well, that's because of the format of a letter. A letter has, let me go ahead and pull up a letter here so we can be looking at the same thing. A letter in modified block format just pick one quickly. Actually, let's just write one. That'll be quicker. Okay, so in modified block format, let me just go to the next page. We're going to have at the top here some kind of letterhead. And then we're going to have, oops. Here. Let me just open, okay, I'm going to open, I'm going to open up a letter. That's, I think, a better way of handling this. Okay, we're just going to look at this quick. An example of a letter. And you can see here I did one, two, three, four, five, six, six tabs to get to here. I didn't center it, even though it looks like it's approximately in the center. So it's set on the tab for the three inch. I want this J in my letter to match up with my sincerely or my very truly here. And so if I tab one, two, three, four, five, six times here, 
I'm going to tab one, two, three, four, five, six times here, and it's going to line up perfectly. And then I also I'm going to tab six times over here, so this lines perfectly. So my C in Cynthia, my S in Sincerely, and my J in June are all going to line up. So if I were to fold the paper, it's going, they're going to all be horizontal, uh, vertically arranged. If I had centered this, if I had taken all of these tabs out and centered it, it's going to be just a scooch over. And so let's say I center this. This is also not going to line up because uh, sincerely is a little bit shorter phrase than June 16th, 2014. So this is going to be a little bit more towards the middle. Cynthia Groover is a little bit longer than Sincerely, so it's so the C isn't going to line up with the S. Paralegal is going to be the shortest of all. So it's going to be a little bit more towards the center than the S, a lot more towards the center than the than the C. It now looks like a pretty crazy letter. Almost no one submits a letter like this. But pretty routinely, I have students centering this and then using the tab for this. Well, that makes this look okay. But it causes there to be a disconnect between these nicely lined up components and this. We want this to be also in alignment. And so that's why we tab to the approximate middle. That is really important. That's one of the reasons why you can't PDF your documents and send it to me because I check every time for this. And especially in the first couple of letters, a significant number of students center that first one. Don't give away points. There's no reason to, to center it when you can do the approximate tab to the approximate center approach. So keep that in mind. So you, you will really use the center command when you're doing titles and things like that, but you're going to tab to the approximate center when you're doing the date and the signature block in the letter. If you're not sure which one of these to use, send me an email and I'll be glad to clarify what you need to do for a particular assignment. Let's talk about how you're going to set up your spacing. Um, this is another thing to do globally at the beginning. So we're going to go, we're still in home base, and we're going to go over here to this section. We're going to go to this bar, and you're going to see I've clicked on um, a single spacing. And I don't have a space before, and I don't have a space after my paragraphs. That doesn't mean I'm not going to add spaces, but it means I'm in control of that. I'm not allowing the computer to tell me what I'm supposed to do. So let me just type up some sentences here. Um, now is the time for all good men to come to the country. It is their patriotic duty to defend it bravely both men and women should um, work to keep their country safe. Okay, so this is my paragraph. Now I want to go to my next paragraph. I'm going to hit space. I'm going to start typing. Um, Americans have fought in many wars, including the um, Including World War One and World War Two. In both wars, Americans by defending our freedoms. Now you might think, well gosh, wouldn't it be easier if 
instead of setting up this way, I did this, right? Because now that space is going to be automatic. Um, there are times where that might actually benefit you, but you're going to find in our documents many times your spacing is going to be kind of erratic and kind of format based. Your work won't always be paragraphs, and as a result, you're not going to want to do that. So you're not going to. Um, let me go ahead. You're not going to want to do that. You're going to want to set up your document for single space and have it so it both reads add and add. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit return and I'm going to control this. I can make it go away. I can add two. I can add one. That's the way you want to do it. Um, now, of course, at the end of the document, there's some that I may decide, well, I want to double space. So at the end, I can double space. Usually when you double space documents, you don't have an extra. If you single space the documents, you will do that. General rule of thumb. This just makes it easier. You're not fighting against the formatting in your documents. So go ahead and set up. Here's another helpful hint. Set it up for single space. No additional spaces before or after paragraphs. And you can set this up as a default, just like we did with the font over here. We clicked on this little button and set it up for all time. We're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to click on this. We want it to be left. This is left justification. We don't need to have any automatic indention. And we're not going to have any spacing before or after. I'm going to hit it set as default. I'm going to make this my new normal template and we're good to go. That's going to help a lot in formatting, but you're going to have to remember to go ahead and add the space. So the reason that we removed that automatic uh, space between paragraphs is not because we don't want the space. It's because we want to control the space. We don't want Microsoft Word to be forcing us into formatting choices that aren't going to make sense for our document. The last thing I want to talk about are footers. We're going to do footers from time to time, so let me show you how we go about doing it. First of all, let's talk about what a footer and a header is. A footer and a header, a footer is what is at the bottom of the page. So it would go right here. And a header is what goes, not surprisingly, at the top. Okay, so we're going to look at is it under insert. Yes, so we hit insert, and you can see we have header and footer. In this course, we're going to be using footers. I can't think of any time that we use a header. There might be. Well, yeah, there could be sometimes, but mainly we're going to use footers. So we're going to click on footer so here. One thing that will happen with footers that's important to remember is that you will, if you have not made those global adjustments to your font, you may find that you have your whole document be in Times New Roman, but your footer is in some other font. You're going to lose a point if you don't make that correction. If you've made that global change, you know, like what I pointed to up here when we clicked on this and did this, then this is going to be okay. So we're going to say it's plaintiff's first original complaint. If you've made that global change, it's also going to appear in your footer. But if you haven't made the global change and you're just doing that select all or you're just setting up the font at the beginning, what can easily happen is you will have the wrong font down here. So be kind to yourself. Remove that opportunity by changing this. Another thing you're likely to want to do is to add a page number. That's also the insert button. So I'm going to hit insert, page number, bottom of page. A nice approach is to make my, okay, so let me go back. So I'm going to tab, 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 oops, tab, insert, page number, current position. There we go. Um, so this will pop up if you choose current position, wherever your cursor is, is where it will populate. This is a good thing to put on court filing. Some local rules require it. 
And now that I'm uh, done with my footer, I'm just going to click back on my body. And if I look at the view one page, you'll see my footer is down there, nicely set up. Many people choose to make their footer smaller. It's okay. If you want to make this 10 point, I don't have any problem with that, or 11 point. But you can keep it 12 if you would like. Okay, so those are some things to keep in mind. Um, this is kind of our first presentation. I hope the information in this video has proved to be helpful. I thank you for your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Take care.